From Creation Ministries International, you're listening to Creation.com's article podcast, the research and insights that give God the glory, refutes evolution, and gives you the answers to defend your faith. I'm Joseph Darnell. As Creation.com and Creation Magazine have been continuously published since 1978, we occasionally produce an article podcast of articles from the archives for historical interest, such as this episode. For teaching and sharing purposes, listeners are advised to supplement this historical article with more up-to-date ones. Check the show notes for more about human fossils based on more recent research. Now that being said, Let's dip back into 1991 with the article, Where Are All the Human Fossils? What happened to all the people who were not on board Noah's Ark? If there were many millions of people populating the Earth at the time of the Flood, as creationists have suggested, wouldn't many of the people have been buried in flood sediments? So why do we not find hundreds or even thousands of human fossils in the rock layers regarded as flood sediments, with perhaps even some human fossils alongside, say, dinosaur fossils? These are, of course, fair questions that are commonly asked. Because of our understanding of the flood from the scriptures, we might expect to find human fossils in flood strata, so it is rather surprising, at first glance, that we don't find any. However, scripture, backed up by so much other evidence, is very clear that there was a global flood and that the pre-flood people were destroyed, so there must obviously be an explanation for this lack of human fossils. Consequently, we are going to attempt an explanation for exploring possible processes during the flood and logical deductions from present observations that could help us understand why there are no undisputed human fossils found in flood strata. There are some claims and reports of human artifacts and remains in rock layers that are clearly part of the flood sediments. However, many of these claims are not adequately documented in any scientific sense. While those few reports have appeared in the scientific and related literature remain open to question or other interpretations. For example, the book Ancient Man, a handbook of puzzling artifacts, looks like an impressive and voluminous collection of such evidence. But on closer examination, many of the artifacts, though puzzling archaeologically, still belong to the post-flood era, while other reports and claims are either antiquated or sketchy and amateurish. Often, lay scientists claiming to have found human artifacts or fossils have not recorded specific location details, so that professional scientists investigating the claims have had difficulty finding the location in which the sample in question came. Also, lay scientists have in the past not kept some of the rock which encloses the fossil or artifact as proof of its in situ occurrence. These two oversights have often made it well nigh impossible to reconstruct or prove where fossils or artifacts came from, thus rendering such finds virtually useless. Fossilized hammers and supposed human footprints in ancient geological strata, regarded by evolutionists as deposited millions of years before man evolved, but regarded by creationists as flood deposits, are extremely difficult to document scientifically above reproach or with any conclusive finality. Merely finding rock around an implement does not prove it is pre-flood. For example, it has been claimed that a gold chain was found in black coal. However, the artifact evidently was exhibited as a clean gold chain with no coal clinging to it. So we see no evidence that the chain was actually found in the coal just the claim that it was. While one would never assume any dishonesty on the part of the people concerned, because proper scientific procedures have not been followed, the exhibit has proven to be almost useless in convincing a generally skeptical scientific community and apathetic lay public. Thus, should genuine human fossils or artifacts from the time of Noah's flood be found, then it is mandatory that proper scientific procedures be followed to document the geological context in order to guarantee that the scientific significance of such a find is unequivocally demonstrated. Regretfully, of course, the hardened skeptic would still remain unconvinced, but at least such a find may still awaken some of the apathetic public and a few of the more open-minded scientists. What is needed, of course, are actual human bones fossilized as an integral part of rock strata that are demonstrably ancient in evolutionary terms and therefore are usually flood sediments of the creationist framework for Earth history. Yet here is where the real hard unequivocal evidence is lacking and why people ask the question, 
where are all the human fossils? We simply cannot point to the report of a human skull found in so-called tertiary brown coal in Germany, for there is no definitive scientific report available on this object, even though its existence has been verified by the staff of the Mining Academy in Freiburg. If it is a colified human skull, how is it possible to distinguish it from a clever carving in such a way that it becomes conclusive proof? Even if it were demonstrated as genuine, are we sure that the tertiary brown coal in question was a flood stratum? In some parts of the world, some of the isolated so-called tertiary sedimentary basins could easily be classified, according to some creationist geological schemes, as post-flood strata. After all, the early flood geologists, prior to the advent of Lyellian uniformitarianism and evolutionary geological timescale, apply the term tertiary to those rock strata that they believed to be post-flood. The controversial Guadalupe skeletons are another case in point. Without wishing to take sides on the debate, and in any case the hard data are still inconclusive either way, the fact remains that even if perchance these skeletons were so-called Miocene, that in and of itself would still not prove that the skeletons were in flood sediments, and therefore represented the remains of pre-flood people. Being a subdivision of the so-called tertiary, these Miocene rocks may still be post-flood sediments, and so these Guadalupe skeletons may still not be human fossils from Noah's flood. Perhaps the fossilized human skeletons that come closest to having been pre-flood humans buried in flood strata are those skeletons found in Moab, Utah. In a copper mine there, two definitely human skeletons were found in Cretaceous-age sandstone, supposedly more than 65 million years old. The bones still joined together naturally and stained green with copper carbonate. While many regard these bones as recently buried, there still remains the remote possibility that there are pre-flood human fossils. But we can only concur that there is no definite, unequivocal evidence of human remains in those rock strata that can definitely be identified as flood sediments. This realization at first glance is rather perplexing, but some clues to unravel this puzzle emerge on investigation. Let's begin by considering the nature of the fossil record. Most people don't realize that in terms of numbers of fossils, 95% of the fossil record consists of shallow marine organisms such as corals and shellfish. Within the remaining 5%, 95% of them are all the algae and plant tree fossils, including the vegetation that now makes up the trillions of tons of coal and all the other invertebrate fossils including the insects. Thus, the vertebrates such as fish, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals together make up very little of the fossil record. In fact, just 5 of 5%, which is a mere 0.25% of the entire fossil record. So, comparatively speaking, there are very, very few amphibian, reptile, bird, and mammal fossils, yet so much is often made of them. For example, the number of dinosaur skeletons in all the world's museums both public and university, totals around 2,100 fossils. Furthermore, of this 0.25% of the fossil record which is vertebrates, only 1% of that 0.25% are vertebrate fossils that consist of more than a single bone. For example, there is only one stegosaurus skull that has been found, and many of the horse species are each represented by only one specimen of one tooth. In any regional area where vertebrate fossils are found, there is a general tendency for these land animals to be higher up in the rock strata sequence on top of the strata containing marine organisms. This has been interpreted by evolutionists as representing the evolutionary sequence of life from marine vertebrates through fish and amphibians to the land-based vertebrates. However, this same observation can be more reasonably explained by flood geologists as due to the order of burial of the different ecological zones of organisms by the flood waters. For example, shallow marine organisms' ecological zones would be the first destroyed by the fountains of the Great Deep breaking open, with the erosional runoff from the land due to the torrential rainfall concurrently burying them. On this basis, then we would probably not expect to find human remains in the early fossil strata, which would contain only shallow marine organisms. The fossil record as we understand it at the moment certainly fits with this, 
Additionally, the majority of the few mammal fossils in the fossil record are in the so-called tertiary strata, which most creationist geologists nowadays regard as post-flood strata. If this is the case, then there really aren't very many mammal fossils in the late flood sediments. There are a few mammal fossils in the so-called Mesozoic rocks. Consequently, it's not only human fossils that are not found in the flood sediments, but there is a relative lack of other mammal fossils also. Of course, in the post-flood era, humans have been able to make the necessary decisions to get away from the local residual catastrophes responsible for the post-flood tertiary strata, so we wouldn't expect to find humans fossilized in post-flood sediments like we find other mammals. Another problem in the fossil record is, as we have already seen, the fragmentary nature of what is often found, which makes identification difficult. For example, a 5 million year old piece of bone that was thought to be the collarbone of a human-like creature is actually part of a dolphin rib. Such genuine mistakes are inevitable when only fragments of bone are recovered from the rocks. We can't even be sure that some bone fragments already found in flood sediments aren't in fact human remains, having been labeled something else by evolutionists. After all, because of their evolutionary molecules to man belief bias, they don't expect to find human remains in lower, older strata. We'll continue to look for the human fossils right after this short break. There are features on the Earth's surface that scientists cannot explain with theories of changes over millions of years or even billions of years by the geologic processes that we see occurring commonly today. However, when you explore the evidence from a biblical worldview, the geologic features marking our planet's surface make sense given the worldwide catastrophic flood described in the book of Genesis. Author Mike Ord in his book, Flood by Design, explores what is termed as the retreating stage of the flood, the seven-month period when the waters receded and the landscapes which are familiar to us were formed by a myriad of processes like uplifts and sinking, erosion, and much more, which answers important questions regarding unusual dispersals of rocks over hundreds of miles, how quickly mountains and valleys were carved, emergence of continents and the formation of ocean basins, percussion marks shaped by vast and violently moving water, why very gradual erosion and deposits of soil cannot explain surface formations, and the study of geomorphology and what it can reveal. Flood by Design takes you into a fascinating aspect of the Genesis Flood you may have never considered. Imagine unusual rock formations and evidence that only the biblical flood model can fully explain. Filled with many photographs and easy-to-understand illustrations and charts, the book is a powerful source of research and answers for high school students and beyond. So get a copy of Flood by Design at creation.com store. Another factor to be considered is the differential mobility of humans and many land-dwelling animals compared to much of the abundant marine life, such as corals, barnacles, and shellfish. When the flood began, the rising flood waters would have probably encouraged humans and mobile land animals to preferentially move away from low-lying areas to higher ground. Thus their being swept away by the flood waters would probably have been postponed, perhaps for weeks, until all the high ground also was covered. Consequently, we would predict that it would be highly unlikely for us to find human fossils now in sediments that were deposited early in the flood year. Indeed, when we look at the fossil record, as we have already seen, we find that in the so-called Paleozoic strata, there is a preponderance of marine creatures, beginning with trilobites, corals, sea anemones, shellfish of all types, and so much more. This is what we would expect, given that the flood waters carried sediments from the land out to the sea where they would then be deposited, burying many of the relatively immobile seafloor-dwelling creatures, followed later by destruction and burial of fish. Thus, it is not surprising that we see the land-dwelling animals being preserved later in the fossil record, where they would have been buried later in the fossil year as the rising flood waters finally covered the land surface completely. The next question to ask is, would all the people still be alive when the flood waters finally covered all the land and swept them away, buried and preserved as fossils in the later flood sediments? 
Can we assume that there was no destruction of the people's bodies in the flood waters and by other processes operating during the flood? Probably not. The turbulence of the water, even in a local flood, can be horrific, particularly when the fast-moving current picks up not only sand and mud, but large boulders. Under such conditions, human bodies would probably be thrown around like flotsam and would tend to be destroyed by the agitation and abrasion. But even if human bodies were buried in the later flood sediments, destruction could still occur subsequently, that is, post-deposition. For example, if groundwaters permeating through the sediments, such as sandstone, contain sufficient oxygen, then the oxygen would probably oxidize the organic molecules in the buried bodies and so destroy them. This could be regarded as a type of weathering. Likewise, chemically, active groundwaters could also be capable of dissolving human bones, removing all trace of buried people. Many flood sediments have also undergone chemical and mineralogical changes due to the temperatures and pressures of burial, plus the presence of the water trapped in between the sediment grains. This process of change, known technically as metamorphism, eventually obliterates many fossils in the original sediments, whether they be fossils of shellfish, corals, or mammals, particularly with increasing depth of burial and higher temperatures and pressures. Yet another process that could destroy buried human bodies would be the intrusion of molten igneous rock into the flood sediments and through them to the surface to form volcanoes and lava flows. Such processes involve heat intense enough to melt rocks and recrystallize them. As the hot molten rock rises through the sediments, the sediments are often baked by the heat, and again chemical and mineralogical changes occur that obliterate many contained fossils. All of these factors greatly lengthen the odds of finding a human fossil today. Not only would the turbulence of the sediment-laden floodwaters probably destroy some of the human bodies swept away, but deferential suspension of the waters could have made it hard to bury those bodies that survived the turbulence. This is because human bodies, when immersed in water, tend to bloat, and therefore become lighter and float to the surface. This is what is meant by deferential suspension. The human bodies floating on the water surface could therefore for some time be carrion for whatever birds were still flying around seeking places to land and food to eat. Likewise, marine carnivores still alive in their watery habitat would also devour corpses. Furthermore, if the bodies floated long enough and were not eaten as carrion, then they would still have either tended to decompose or be battered to destruction on and in the waters before any burial could take place. This could explain why we still don't find human fossils higher up in the fossil record or geological column, that is, the later flood sediments. When we take all these factors into account, it would seem unlikely that many of the people present at the time the flood waters came could have ended up being fossilized. Even if a handful, perhaps a few thousand, were preserved, when such a small number is distributed through the vast volume of flood sediments, the chances of one being found at the surface are mathematically very, very low, let alone of being found by a professional scientist who could recognize its significance and document it properly. Putting all of these factors together and assuming that they are all realistic possibilities, then the probability of finding a human fossil in the flood sediments today would be very, very small. To date, our investigations of the fossil record indicate that there are no human fossils in flood strata, so perhaps some of our explanations here could be some of the reasons why this is so. Finally, however, we need to consider the purpose for which God sent the flood. For this provides yet another reason, and perhaps the main reason, why we do not find any human fossils in the flood sediments, and why we should not expect to find any. In Genesis 6 verse 7, we read that God said he would destroy man whom he had created from the face of the earth. So perhaps God deliberately made sure that the floodwaters did just that, destroying every trace of man and his artifacts from the pre-flood world, if this is what he meant by what he had recorded in the scriptures. Yes, God did say that he would send a flood to destroy the beasts of the field and every living thing in whose nostrils was the breath of life also but yet we find fossils of the plants and the animals and everything else. How then can it be that we find animal fossils and not human fossils or artifacts? 
When God said that he was equally going to destroy the animals and mankind from the face of the earth by the flood. Elsewhere in scripture, we learn that as far as God's judgment of sin is concerned, when God says that he wants the offenders removed, then this means utter destruction. We see this in the case of the children of Israel moving into the promised land. They were told to utterly destroy the Canaanites because of their evil and evil practices. God had pronounced judgment on the Canaanites, and the Israelites were but his instruments in executing judgment. The fact that they didn't utterly destroy the Canaanites ended up being a lingering malignant problem, as the Israelites repeatedly lapsed into the sinful practices of the Canaanites who had survived the conquest. Similarly, we see that God issued the instruction to King Saul to utterly destroy the Amalekites. Again, when God meant his judgment to be utter destruction, he meant what he said, and Saul's disobedience in not carrying through this instruction led to his own downfall. It would seem to be unloving of God to execute such relentless judgment, but such is God's abhorrence of sin that its penalty must be seen for what it is, utter destruction and removal of all trace. If God cannot tolerate sin, His holiness cannot look on sin, then all trace of sin has to be removed in judgment, which necessitates utter destruction. Should human remains have been allowed to survive the flood as fossils? then there could also have been the possibility of such remains being worshipped and revered. However, at least some of the animals became fossilized. Though Genesis 6, 5-7 implies that they were affected by the entry of sin into the world, they were not morally accountable. Also, they serve as a witness to God's judgment at the time of the flood. In other words, when we look at the fossil record and seem not to see any human fossils, this should remind us how much God hates sin. We should see the fossils as a sober reminder of the penalty of sin and the character of God's judgment, and as a testimony to the reality of Noah's flood and the trustworthiness of the scriptural record. The Apostle takes up this theme in 2 Peter 3.7. He says that just as God created the world and judged the world the first time by the flood, then so too he is going to keep his word and judge the world the second time by fire. Man therefore should take heed and make peace with his Creator while there is still time, before God comes again as judge with sudden and swift judgment. As far as we are aware at this present time, there are no indisputable human fossils in the fossil record that we could say belong to the pre-flood human cultures. When we endeavor to understand some of the processes that may have occurred during the flood and also the real nature of the fossil record, we are not embarrassed by the seeming lack of human fossils. We don't have all the explanations as to how the evidence came to be that way, and it may be that in the future we will discover some human fossils. However, there is also much about the fossil record that the evolutionists have a hard time explaining. On the other hand, we should also realize that we don't have all the answers either. And we never will. Even though God has left us with evidence for creation and the flood, the Bible still says that without faith it is impossible to please and believe Him. Hebrews 11.6 Because we weren't there at the time of the flood, we cannot scientifically prove what happened, so there will always be aspects that will involve our faith. However, it is not blind faith. As we have investigated the evidence, we have seen nothing to contradict what the Bible says about a world flood, and we can be satisfied that there are reasonable explanations consistent with Scripture for the seeming lack of human fossils in flood rocks. The Creation.com article podcast is hosted by me, Joseph Darnell, and produced out of the U.S. studio of Creation Ministries International. Learn more about our ministry at creation.com. This episode's article was written by Andrew Snelling. If you're interested in listening to previous episodes of the article podcast, they're all pretty much timeless. We made them just for you. Listen on a road trip or at the gym, and at your convenience, as time allows for you to study creation. Our speakers and scientists host a really cool talk show called Creation.com Talk, which you can find right here in your podcast app or on our YouTube channel. And get in touch if you would like to have one of our scientists speak at your church. 
If you'd like to help us, become a monthly supporter making a donation at creation.com slash donate. You can also help out by telling your friends and family to check out the magazine, Creation Magazine. Be sure to follow Creation Ministries International on Facebook and Instagram, or subscribe to the free e-newsletter. From everyone at creation.com, thanks for listening.